Good morning, everybody, um, and welcome to this uh, side event about the European research infrastructures and their contribution to GEO and EuroGEOS. Um, I got an, uh, uh, an email by Robert Jan Smits, and he agreed to be in this session, but he also said that he might be busy in many other uh, uh, things. So he may come later. Um, so I will, but will start the session now. And uh, I'm happy to have all the other speakers, including Barbara Ryan here. And um, well, this this um, side event was organized by the so-called Envy Community, the European Environmental Research Infrastructure Community. And we want to show that we can and want to give a sustainable contribution to the Eurogeos. Um, this is a this is a picture of the of the um, environmental research infrastructures in Europe. Um, they have been been. Um, they have been established over the over the past uh, 10, 15 years, and you can see a lot of these infrastructures in the atmospheric domain, in the aquatic domain, the solid earth domain, and the ecosystem and uh, biodiversity sphere. In the inner gray circle, you can see those who have been accepted by the so-called European uh, European Strategic Forum for Research Infrastructure uh, to, to be further developed. The other ones are, let's say, advanced communities. So to explain this a little bit more, what is the life cycle of an infrastructure? The life cycle of an infrastructure is happening on several um, on several levels. So there is the S3 pro, uh, process. The European Strategic Forum is uh, taking these infrastructures to the roadmap one day. And then uh, there is a, a start for the preparation and finally for be operational. And there is a, a, a sequence of evaluations from the S3 there. Then the infrastructure, of course, has to be developed. And since we are most uh, most of the environmental infrastructures are um, distributed infrastructures, it's very important to have the standardization of this this measurement sites. Uh, whenever you see, for example, the label of ICOS, the Integrative Carbon Observation System, Actris on uh, clouds and and um, and aerosols, or um, other infrastructure labels, Euro Argo is an ocean example, um, on on the side or on the sensor, you can see that it has run through a, a long-term standardization uh, process and we, we can ensure the highest quality. Uh, with the construction also comes the data infrastructure and this is something I really want to stress here, that we are building stable data infrastructures inside the, the uh, infrastructures, the research infrastructures, which are, for example, connected to the services of the European Open Science Cloud. And with that, we can really good, give a very important contribution also to, to uh, GEOS as a whole. And then we have a government level and we have a support from the, from the European Commission. So it's starting with community building, then the, the European Commission is supporting the preparatory phase. And then also uh, later on, when the, the infrastructures have developed some kind of a landmark support project. So how are the infrastructures related to GEO or to GEOS? Uh, there could be a direct um, um, contribution or also an indirect contribution via global networks. These are a few examples here how we are related to GEO. So you see here the logos of all these infrastructures. Uh, not all of them, but most of them that you have seen in the first picture uh, already. And then you can see, for example, ICOS, the Integrated Carbon Observation System. It's related to a global uh, data 
integration initiative that has once started as a, as a, a work of, of a few scientists said, ah, oh, well, that's important to do this, and has uh, developed a very important uh, a data source. Uh, I think I don't have to mention the Global Atmosphere Watch or Fluxnet. They have now really uh, developed a global of standards uh, of, of, of data networks. And uh, for example, these three more, more carbon and greenhouse gas oriented uh, infrastructure uh, or global networks, they, we are at the moment trying to, to integrate them in the geocarbon and, and greenhouse gas initiative. And uh, I think uh, this is a, an important contribution that the infrastructures here can, can do. Uh, giving this this data support and integration support that's already there for Europe also as an opportunity for global inf integration and you can see all these lines that um, <coughs> that are connecting the infrastructure either directly to the geo initiatives and flagship or indirectly uh, there is a booth with exactly this background um, uh, or, or wall so whenever you want to discuss more or, or learn more about the, the infrastructures, come to the Envy booth and uh, there will be people there to, to discuss with you. So for this side event, uh, we are already in the welcome and introduction. Robert Jan Smits is still missing, but Barbara Ryan is here and uh, I want to ask her to give her statement. Uh, I think in this place it's not so uh, necessary to introduce Barbara Ryan. <laughs> She's uh, uh, the the director of the of the GU Secretariat. Uh, but just for those who don't know her, she's holding three degrees in uh, geology, geography, and civil engineering. And uh, before she got this very important job in the GU. Uh, coordination she was working for the as associate director of the for geography in the US geological survey <laughs> and was there responsible for the Landsat remote sensing so uh, a very uh, strong background also Thank you thanks Barbara. well good morning everyone and it is indeed a pleasure um, to be here um, first of all, before we get into the specifics, um, I want to just say for anybody that hasn't attended a geoplenary, the side events are like the highlight of the week. <laughs> and so enjoy your time uh, Monday and Tuesday. Of course, we hope the plenary on Wednesday and Thursday will be a little bit more exciting and not quite so bureaucratic. Uh, but it's always a really good way to go into those plenaries uh, with just the energy uh, of the site events. The, you know, rooms are smaller, people are coming to talk about one particular topic, and usually the discussion is really open and candid, so, so thanks for that. Um, you know, in addition to that, a uh, couple points that uh, Verna said about my uh, about my background, it was I worked a lot on the Landsat data policy issue. But before that, I was a groundwater hydrologist with the U.S. Geological Survey and spent 20 years doing that. And it was a pretty immense infrastructure. Now, at that point, it had been in place for 100 years, and so it was an operational infrastructure. But there were still really serious um, research components that were being done on it, and there were still subsets within the whole organization about research infrastructures. And when we fast forward to the geo vision about ensuring um, humankind and that Earth observations inform decisions that are being made for humankind. It requires coordinated, comprehensive, and sustained Earth observations. Now, we talk about coordinated globally, uh, regionally, nationally. I would say even within entities and organizations, certainly comprehensive. You can look at whether it's space-based assets or ground-based assets, marine-based assets, or in situ, and sustained 
observations. And I think that's probably one of the greatest challenges that's being faced when we talk about research infrastructures is that um, the communities or the institutional support behind those may not be quite as robust. And yet I can tell you they're every bit as important. And this, this uh, I would say, research to operations transition that Verna put up on that slide is really important. So with a geo hat on, we want to do whatever we can do to support, advocate, um, get people to pay more attention to the coordination that's being done uh, for um, these research infrastructures. Um, I guess um, what I might say is um, a lot of GEO's first decade was on the provider side, making sure that we had coordinated, comprehensive, maybe sustained earth observations. And yet, as we go into this next decade, the linkage to users or the bridge from providers to users is going to be really important. Because having grown up in public sector institutions, whether it was the Geological Survey, whether it was WMO, or whether it's now GEO, <laughs> it's those users that are going to come back in and advocate for sustained observation. So we can talk until we're blue in the face, and yet uh, many of our funders think they expect us to say that, that we're the greatest thing around. And when it, your, your infrastructures are strengthened by people outside your community coming in and saying, we couldn't do our job if we didn't have that. And so I, I, I think it's really important to think about this, um, this full, the full cycle there with the connection from providers to users. And then the last thing, and this will be no surprise to most of you uh, or many of you in the room, is that uh, the importance of broad open data sharing is just critical. And again, I would argue, maybe on the research side, no matter where you are in the world, there are still challenges with sharing data. And we've got a whole a whole host of reasons why. We don't want to get scooped because we need to publish our research findings before we release that data. Uh, and we, and so there's, I guess I would say no matter where we are, uh, even in the countries that have the best and most robust data sharing policies, they're still not perfect. And so we would always come back and say, uh, particularly if that information is funded by the public sector. So if taxpayers are in fact funding your infrastructures, the data that's being collected, your salaries to collect that data, we really need to encourage uh, getting that data out sooner, faster. Uh, you may sit on it for a little while to make sure it's quality assured and quality controlled, but the pressure to share data uh, even out of these infrastructures is equally important as it is from the, from the operational infrastructures. So for me, those are the really key messages. Um, Research infrastructures are going to have a key role. The transition to more sustainable funding or the transition to an operational environment is really important. The connection with users to help with that transition. Broad open data policies will be an enabler to getting those users to come in and support your infrastructures. Uh, and so that bridge is just really important. And then I guess maybe just in closing, um, the role of participating organizations, and uh, Werner is in one, are just essential. GEO is an intergovernmental mechanism. You'll see we've got 105 member countries, and that's critical for sure. But I would say over the last couple years, participating organizations are coming into their own. They now occupy, and there are 115 of them, they now occupy about half the seats on something we call the program board. Uh, they're fully engaged in our flagships, our initiatives, uh, or our community activities. And for me, uh, in GEO, these participating organizations, and we can pick ICOs for example, are already coordinating their own community. 
seeing uh, ILTER in the audience. There's a coordination that's already being take that's already being done in that network. What we need to do in Geo is to just make sure that we're advocating for that coordination not duplicating that coordination that you guys are already doing and that we're looking for the interstices between and among these participating organizations that are doing immense coordination work. So again, I want to just thank you for carving out time to be here uh, at the site event, hopefully for the whole week. Those of you that are coming to plenary, uh, we definitely want to hear from you during the event. So thank you very much, and Verna, I'll turn it, uh, turn it back to you. Thank you very much, Barbara. And as one remark uh, about the open data policy, this is uh, in the genes of the infrastructure. So uh, there is, there will be no infrastructure without open data policy. So I think that's uh, also quite important to mention that uh, we we are currently coordinating this in the NV Plus proposal that we are really uh, harmonizing our data policies, but even more harmonizing also our our data life cycles. There has been. The so-called reference model developed for the for the uh, um, a typical infrastructure, and this can, uh, while you are building up your e-infrastructure, your internal e-infrastructure, just can just taken as a as a, a, a blueprint, for, uh, and it's fed by the experience of the more advanced infrastructures, so that the new ones can can, uh, um, yeah, in a way. Not uh, not simply copy and paste, but use it as a as a uh, a guideline for for the development of their own uh, data lifecycle. And open data is the first line <laughs> on this. So what we are now um, want to present to you are four examples of four case studies for infrastructures and how they are contributing to uh, the the geo initiative and flagships. With one exception, because uh, there is, we have, have turned around the, the view from the uh, flagship Geobon towards the infrastructure, and Letizia is, is going to tell us how the expectations maybe from the from the uh, infra uh, from the uh, flagship from Geo towards the the infrastructure is. But the first uh, um, the first contribution. I, I, I took the advantage of coordinating as ICOS is the ICOS contribution to the GeoCarbon Initiative. And this is uh, presented by Joni Heiskanen, who uh, about a year ago joined the ICOS head office. And um, he is our uh, international liaison officer. And with that international liaison, he uh, stepped very quickly into the to the um, uh, geo uh, initiative and the geo activities and together with Andre and Antonio and uh, also with Nabucco Saigusa he is now coordinating the the uh, GOC um, the GOC secretariat he studied limnology and atmospheric scientists at the University of Helsinki, and he's holding a PhD, which in Finland means that he is allowed to wear publicly a sword. He did not bring his he did not bring his sword to the U.S. This was too risky, uh, but you can see him every now and then in Helsinki walking around with that. <laughs> okay, <clears throat> thank you. The sword is more symbolic than it's for uh, protecti protecting the truth. So I'm not waving that around. But um, so as as I'm as I'm uh, working in ICOS and also working for geocarbon and greenhouse gas initiative, I think I have a good insider view on these two topics. Um, I'd like to start with a vision of of what we want to do in geocarbon, and it, it's it's exactly what. Uh, Bob Ryan said there, as a, as a final remark, that we want to coordinate globally these uh, carbon-related um, observations. And uh, there are already so many existing efforts to do that. 
we want to understand how those well affect also to the change in climate but not only that that we are not only staying in the scientific level but then there is this uh, societal benefit areas and that is what affects of course our lives where we are living and this comes then to policy making so we want to also uh, give our contribution of the of our understanding of how carbon cycle and greenhouse gases work and how those effect affect these other other uh, levels in life of course this is very complex situation we have this societal dimension there which comes from from citizens all the way to the cities and and governments then th there is private sector NGOs and so forth well science there are also the scientific dimension where we are working because we are now in, in the in the level uh, field of science so there is these different um, domains as we call them uh, ecosystems oceans and at atmosphere but then there is also what we are observing like gases and aerosols on top of that there are natural processes but also human influence on these and then we are using different <laughs> observations to cover these like satellites in situ and so forth so it's quite complex but geocarbon wants to collaborate within the scientific sector and across societal sectors. So that's one point of, of geocarbon initiative. Well, ICOS then, well, ICOS has a lot of experience on collaboration within the scientific domain. There's a long history coming uh, where we are now. ICOS works in the atmosphere and in, in land ecosystems and in the oceans. So that is a rich background we are building on this. ICOS is European, and as you can see from the right-hand side, it is a distributed network of stations. It covers quite nicely to Europe. And then also ICOS has a, has a vision. We want to measure all the important parameters that they are rela related to greenhouse gases with the best available techniques there are and the standardized methods to do that. That is, of course, to provide what is needed. Scientists need data we want to provide the high quality data. But also some data products like maps, emission maps from uh, in a country level, for example, that is also what we want to provide. Of course, this needs sustained funding and that is uh, where we are getting with this. <coughs> so integration across domains, that's one thing that's, that's shared with, with ICOS and uh, Geocarbon initiative. Those are the ICOS domains where we are measuring. <coughs> ICOS spends a lot of time and effort and manpower to put these different data sources together. And we are then providing these data from one single source. It's the ICOS carbon portal. The different users can go and uh, get that bit of information that is, that is uh, important for them. And that is what we are bringing, bringing to GEO and to geocarbon uh, specifically. On top of that, so this is the core what ICOS is doing, but then ICOS is also networked. So we are closely working with uh, a modeling community and remote sensing communities to provide, for example, uh, these uh, regional emission estimates. The whole picture is, of course, much broader than this even. So it, it covers the whole span from observations to services to knowledge and all the way to decisions. And this is where geocarbon wants to be. And for that, we have different tasks or work what we are doing in geocarbon. It comes from the cross-sectoral engagement to data flows, identifying what is actually missing from the data. We are currently uh, gathering and all the way to sustained uh, products we are providing and services. So this is a summary of what IGOS brings to the table. So data. We are the European uh, observation network of in-situ observations in, in these domains. Then also integration how these different type of data sets need to be handled so that they can distribute it from one single source. 
experience also, as you saw that the ICOS is distributed and network, we have a long experience in managing these, these kind of uh, um, operators to join the forces and make, make these kind of services. And of course, uh, work. We are hosting the Geocarbon Secretariat. But it's, it's not the one-way road. Of course, ICOS gets something out of Geocarbon. Well, for us, it's a good way to promote geo values like open data. That's really important. Also, our contribution to uh, sustainable development goals and societal benefit areas, as well as Paris Agreement. For ICOS scientists and for scientists in general, it is really beneficial to get easier access to data streams. That has been identified in many occasions. Of course, IGOS data gets more used when we are promoting it and giving, giving it free for use. So that's, of course, important for us and for our shareholders. Collaboration and so forth. And then there are some mundane, more mundane, like the good for the image and maybe some funding opportunities that are also there. So this is what I wanted to say from my, my behalf. And uh, I'd like to remind you that there is a flyer in your seat about tomorrow's um, side event, which is about geocarbon, and that's at nine o'clock in this same same uh, space. Also, geocarbon has posters in the Finnish booth and Japanese booth, so you are you might spot them there. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Joni. Are there questions? If not, I want to ask Letizia Navarro uh, to give her presentation about the GeoBon view on the infrastructure. So we have now turned around the, the, the idea uh, uh, and, and the view. Uh, Letizia is Executive Secretary of the uh, GeoBon uh, flagship. And she's based at IDIF in, in Leipzig in Germany. She holds a Master in Ecology, Biodiversity and Evolution from the University Pierre and Marie Curie in Paris and a PhD in Conservation Biology from the University of Lisbon. The floor is Thank yours. you. Thank you. Uh, good morning. So I wanted to start by thanking the organizer, uh, organizer of the side event for giving me an opportunity to present what would be our take on the biodiversity component of Eurogeos. But I wanted to start by briefly presenting, for those that are not familiar with us, what is GeoBond and what it is that we do. So we are the Group on Earth Observation, Biodiversity Observation Network. We are one of the flagship of uh, GEO. And our mission is to improve the acquisition, the coordination, and the delivery of biodiversity observations to a wide range of, user, of users, from decision makers to the scientific community. And ultimately, our vision is to build a globally coordinated biodiversity observation network that can contribute to effective management policies for biodiversity and ecosystem services. Our secretariat is based in uh, Leipzig in Germany, but we are a global partnership. And we actually have too many partners, and I couldn't fit all of them on the slide, so I apologize if your logo is missing from here. But that gives you an idea of, of our network. And this summer, we adopted our new implementation plan for the 2017-2020 uh, time period. And we build our activities around two key components. On the one hand, the development of a standard and flexible framework for biodiversity observations. And on the other hand, the support of the development of biodiversity observation networks. And both of those key components aim at producing policy-relevant outputs. So to develop this framework for biodiversity observations, we are developing the essential biodiversity variables, or EBVs. They are largely inspired by the essential climate variables, for those of you that are more familiar with them. We define them as a minimum set of measurements that are complementary to one another and that capture major dimensions of biodiversity change. So in other words, you can imagine them as a level of integration between raw biodiversity observations and high-level indicators that are needed by countries, either internally, for instance, for environmental impact assessment, ecosystem accounting, or to report, for instance, to the CBD on their progress towards achieving the IG conservation targets. 
DBVs are organized around six classes, uh, genetic composition, species population, species traits, community composition, ecosystem structure, and ecosystem function. But if we want to be able to develop those EBVs, we need to have a coordinated use of Earth observations because those, um, there's many sources for those observations. Some come from um, remote sensing, other are in situ observations, either from monitoring scheme or for, from citizen science, or can emerge from uh, new technologies such as uh, environmental DNA. And that's where we see that the role of the research uh, infrastructure is crucial because we see that they, they will be essential in the acquisition, the mobilization, and the integration of those biodiversity observations. And in fact, if I take the example of Europe for obvious reason, the sustainability of the European observation system will rely on uh, research infrastructure, either because um, they provide the data from in situ biodiversity monitoring per se, or because they contribute to uh, developing some products. And on that note, I would like to highlight uh, the fact that I was informed last week that LifeWatch uh, officially expressed some interest to work with us to uh, develop workflows for EBV uh, development. So as I told you, our other uh, key component is the development of a biodiversity observation network, or BONDS. And their mandate is to contribute to the collection and the analysis of harmonized biodiversity observations, to develop interoperable biodiversity monitoring programs, but also to develop some data standards. Those bonds can be organized at different scales. So we have at the moment three uh, national bonds in China, in Colombia, and in France. There are two regional bonds in the Arctic and in the Asia-Pacific region. And there are two thematic bonds, the marine bond and the freshwater bond that was officially endorsed uh, this summer. And this doesn't mean that there are no other biodiversity observation network out there. Uh, but these are the ones that went through the endorsement process that we have developed at GeoBond. And again, this is where we can see the importance uh, and the relevance of the research infrastructure, because de facto they would be very important components of those biodiversity observation networks. To further support the development of bonds, we are working with the uh, Alexander von Humboldt Institute in Colombia to develop an online platform for capacity building and knowledge exchange that is called Bond in a Box. And this will help the, the development of new bond using a flexible process that could be applied in Europe or within Europe at the national level. And I would now like to focus a little bit more on those uh, policy relevant outputs that we produce. And as I told you earlier, um, EBVs can be seen as the building block of indicators. So concretely, uh, we've been working with our partners to develop a set of global biodiversity change indicators that are designed to um, track progress towards the IG, well, some of the IG biodiversity targets. And those indicators have been endorsed by the CBD, more recently by the IPBAS, and will be used actually in the global assessment of IPBAS that is due for 2019. And those indicators are globals, but they're also meant to be scalable, which means that they can also be used at the regional level or uh, at the national level. More recently, we've also been looking into the sustainable development goals, and we've mapped uh, the different EBV classes to the SDGs. And aside from the usual suspects, which would be SDG 14, life below water, and SDG 15, life on Earth, we also found some relevance of the EBVs for other SEGs, such as zero hunger or health, for instance. But this is still work in progress. For something more concre concrete, I'd like to highlight the work of the Marine Bond in relation to SDG 14. And they've been working with UNEP WCMC to develop an indicator um, on the coverage of protected areas in relation to marine areas. And they're also uh, currently developing a prototype product that would integrate Earth observation, obvious data, and local surveys uh, for target 14.2. On a slightly different aspect, but still policy relevant nonetheless, uh, since this summer, GeoBond has a, a task force that is dedicated to remote sensing. 
Um, and the role of this uh, task force is to improve the application of remote sensing for monitoring uh, biodiversity change, but also to position GeoBorn and the task force as a hub between the space agencies that provide the EBV relevant data and the users. So this task force is still very young, but they already identify what would be their, um, their objective, uh, the medium term. And they would be starting by identifying which are the EBVs that can be produced re using remote sensing. Also informing the committee on Earth observation satellites on the requirement for remote sensing uh, biodiversity observations. And finally, engage with users for feedback and buy-in. And finally, uh, monitoring can also have a high societal relevance when considering something that until now I, I've only just mentioned, which are ecosystem services. And we have a very active working group that is developing uh, a framework to monitor ecosystem services from supply to demand, but also assessing what are the benefits uh, for society. And well, you probably cannot see it very well, but this is what this framework would look like. And it, it has a model component, remote sensing, national statistics, but also field-based observations. And to finish, I would say that um, developing all those products would be a very little use if we didn't have any mechanism to deliver them uh, to the users. So we, had, we are in the process of developing um, a data portal, which would be an EBV spatial browser, uh, where all the EBVs and also the indicators would be accessible um, <coughs> completely openly. Uh, and eventually, in the long term, we hope to also have some tools on this portal where uh, users could uh, calculate some indicators uh, on the fly. So to finish, we will be uh, present in several side events during, uh, during this week. So I, I invite you to, to, to join us for those, uh, for those events. And in case you still want to know more about us, uh, we edited a book last year. That's the GON book on Biodiversity Observation Network. And it's in open access. So I invite you to go and check it out. Thank you for your attention. Thank you very much. Are there questions to Letizia? Yes, Paul. Well, maybe I can just uh, throw something out there. So my name is Mike Gill. I'm co-chair of, of GeoBond. And thanks, Letizia, for a great presentation. And, and uh, you know, the Euro Geos is, is really greatly appreciated, um, not just for Geo, but for GeoBond. We, you know, we're really pleased to see NASA uh, provide these funding opportunities. We're seeing this now. And, uh, and I guess what GeoBond can offer in terms of a European context is uh, we really like to see the, uh, the framework approach that we're using uh, adopted in the way that Barbara was speaking to the, the interstices between connecting these research infrastructures so that we end up with a nice coherent system, not only in Europe, but, but globally. Um, and we're very much keen to, to, to work with you on, on figuring out how to do that. And we see Europe as such an obvious place to do this because there's so much capacity and so much excellent uh, integration already, but there's definitely more that we can do. So we're, we're here to, to, to talk to you. Thanks a lot. Thank you. So now we have uh, already seen the carbon and the loss of biodiversity, but we also have uh, some kind of uh, general ecosystem degradation and uh, uh, this is the background of the GEO initiative. Now I have to, to take a look. The GEO initiative on ecosystem. I've lost my own oh, words. So the GEO ecosystem initiative. It's not, it's not uh, 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 a more, not on preservation of ecosystem. It's quite broad, the GEO uh, uh, ecosystem initiative. I think uh, the initiative is new in the work program. The background of the initiative is quite old. And uh, I'm quite happy to have Michel Mirtel here. He is the, the uh, chair of the International Long-Term Ecosystem Research Network. And he's also the coordinator of the European uh, LTR Horizon 2020 Integrated Activity. 
And on top of this, he also has recently coordinated the ALTR S3 roadmap proposal. So a very busy guy. Uh, he has a master in ecology and environmental engineering and a PhD in plant ecology. Michael, the floor is yours. Thank you, Werner, also for organizing this nice uh, side event. Uh, as uh, several in this auditory will not be aware of what LTR is, um, I will uh, briefly go to the ground to explain it. Uh, so uh, the basic building block are sites, specially explicit units, in many cases catchments, micro catchments or bigger catchments. What we do at these sites is that we observe in the long term any kind of input-output and ecosystem change in between. Um, the key research topics are climate change, biodiversity and land use, eutrophication <coughs> and pollutants, and sustainable socio-ecological systems. So it's also about these human-environment interactions in the long term. Um, the standard observation is about observing the main drivers of change of ecosystem structures and functions, including ecosystem services, with a strong focus uh, on the fast and the slow disturbances and how they affect the system in the long term. Very importantly, and that's the reason why we are in this Envy Plus slot, we try to collaborate as much as possible by collocating infrastructures like LTR, but wherever it's possible to use the same sites, go together with uh, long-term monitoring, uh, like done by ICOS, uh, and also including experiments, if it's design-wise feasible. ILTR in one slide, that's the global network. So we are jumping from the site, from the very bottom to the top. Um, what does it? Um, it's actually a network of thousands of scientists working in about 50 countries, so the number changes. Uh, very importantly, these are around 800 sites, which are more or less well documented and uh, Barbara addressed it in very brief, there is a governance structure. So we are organized in a formalized way from the sites to the global network, and my office is an elected <coughs> one. So people from the coordinators of 50 countries has to elect you uh, to become a chair of ILTR. Very importantly, these national networks and regional groups have become very important stakeholders, counterparts, strategic platforms for development of these physical networks and in the case of Europe, uh, of course, we are an important group working now towards a formalized S3 infrastructure. The major output of all these undertakings is publications. We have a strongly increasing number of publications uh, in the thousands. Uh, and INTR tries to keep the wheel turning with several functions which are indicated in these four sections. Uh, in, in, in very brief, uh, the most important aspects of keeping this wheel turning. ILTR represents the major global biomes and each of the continental groups try to cover uh, the major environmental zones, <coughs> distributed and generic. Um, and the generic means that we try to provide an infrastructure for multiple scientific user communities. Um, it's uh, based on a whole system approach uh, the main focus is here to be able to contextualize any kind of finding, also of a short-term or very small-scale project, in the matrix of the system information available at these sites, to analyze it, to interpret it in a proper way. Um, what's done at the sites is firstly to operate them in the long term, and everyone in the in-situ business knows what I'm talking about. It's the struggle from annual budget to annual budget to keep the wheel turning at the very site. There is a lot of collective responsibility here networked by RLTR. Um, and of course, one of these observations is not just the operation, but the long-term baseline monitoring and the related services. Of course, we try to do whatever we do in close collaborations, collaboration with our related infrastructures and networks, and as indicated, the national, the continental activities contribute to a global network. Um, regarding the first item here, we all are aware of this extremely diverse global and specifically European cultural landscape, so we don't just need one kind of sheep to explore, and the sheep is a metaphor, of course, for a properly designed and equipped site. We need several kinds of sheep to properly explore and investigate these different landscapes. So we introduced, and that's now bringing the European business in, we introduced a hierarchy of site categories uh, with on the top more interdisciplinary, transdisciplinary, 
or a high level of instrumentation and to the bottom, more simple uh, and more numerous. And it's now each country's task to define and to assemble the proper national research infrastructure. And that's the last slide about ILTR. I addressed briefly this whole systems approach. And what is it about? It's about investigating at a given scale, and this here indicates the system or the approach of macrosystems ecology, the interactions of environment and the society in the long term, uh, more mo modern wording, uh, ecosystems or earth critical zone and these human environment interactions. Of course, you need a certain scale actually for uh, long-term investigating these interactions. So we are talking about LTSR platforms in the range of thousands of square kilometers or rather sites in, in the range of one square kilometer. So it's all about this investigation of the life supporting system from the soil aggregates level up to the global level. Here is sitting the in situ element of LTR and to the higher scales we are trying to achieve our targets through proper networking. Uh, in the framework of GEO, uh, well, and this goes without saying, we provide in situ data. One remark here, it's not only the, the data which are recently measured, it's about accessing and making available a huge data <coughs> legacy because these sites have been operated for decades, some of them for more than a century. So this is what we throw into the game here. Of course, we try to use remote sensing services with these issues of scaling mismatch. I want to, to stress here, it's not only about satellite-based remote sensing, but here, for example, um, done by airplanes like LiDAR, a very important interim scale. Um, and, and then the entire aspect of ground truthing and further uh, development of RS services. And then very concretely, what LTR has been doing, we developed a site registry, which is globally tested, and we have a lot of experience in integrating from sites to countries, from countries to continents, and to the global scale. So uh, we are glad to contribute to the future, the, the further, or the future, or the Cheetos successor. Um, very concretely, how does LTR function? Um, because Without knowing that, this could be just like a loose announcement of good intentions. Um, normally, and uh, I'm really uh, unlucky that, or unhappy that uh, Mr. Smith is not here, we have, and these regions take it in turns to be powerful, strong, innovative, and have the money. Uh, for example, Turn in Australia played a very active role. In the beginning, it was the US LTR. Currently, Europe is, is has taken a quite leading role in the uh, development of the services, the standards, and also in the coordination, of course. So what we do, and this is, uh, well, if you want to learn more about ILTR, tomorrow, 11.30 in Meridian B. Um, what we do, and this is now boiling it down to the European scale activities. We have this network of formal national networks. Loose, nicely governed, no money. Uh, on top of that, we recruit from the networks in the many sites Consortia for concrete projects. There is a Elta Horizon 2020 project, so less countries, less partners, of course, because we have to boil it down. And on top of that, the process which uh, Werner mentioned in his introduction, formalizing these infrastructures, and there are two major effects here. So from the bottom to the top, recruit. And from the top to the bottom, and this was addressed in several of the talks already today, standardize and formalize and secure long-term operation. Um, and uh, the, this slide actually links perfectly to Letizia's presentation. We found that if we want to do a long-term observation which covers the entire system in the interplay between abiotic, antibiotic, and society, uh, we found one very nice framework, ecosystem uh, integrity, which rather focus on biogeochemical cycles and, and more the abiotic part, and we have already combined towards a standard observation system to be applied globally, but surely be applied in Europe with the uh, system of the essential biodiversity variables. What we did as a next step, and I think uh, this was, uh, well, I will get back to that in the next slide. Uh, these standard observation variables were chosen with three thoughts uh, in the back of our minds. High sensitivity to environmental change, critical relevance for accepted and broadly used environmental models, 
and the simplicity approach, KISS, keep it simple and stupid, because a design too complex increases the risk of premature damage. So we ended up with five major, f uh, six major blocks of variables, uh, and the second and most critical question was, are they measured? Are the sites fit to do exactly what we suggest they should be doing? We did it, uh, an analysis of uh, 171 sites in Europe, and you see how many of these major blocks of variables are covered by the concrete sites. And this is, I think, was one of the reasons that Barbara approached us, invited us to become a participating organization. Because we have a site registry, which lets you know what the sites are doing in reality. It's not just a dream. And we now, in Europe, cross-check what's being done out there, and what is the cost of upgrading a certain number of sites to formal research infrastructure. And we can provide the individual site operators with this kind of diagram saying, well, you have a lot of homework to do because some of the major blocks are not covered, and we can tell others, you're fine off, small investment, and you're perfectly in the club. This brings us to DAMS, the service uh, in which all these metadata are mapped. It's about sites, data sets, data products, <coughs> and persons. And what you can do there, you can search a site and you can see um, who is responsible, the site's names, uh, some nice pictures, um, um, description, purpose of the site, etc. And last, not, last but not least, uh, metadata like um, the delineation, downloadable, of course. Um, very importantly, we didn't stop at this stage. And we have a plan, we have a concept to, in the future, uh, use the DAMES and other sources about site metadata to assign them DIOs, unique identifiers for each site, to translate any kind of standard uh, of metadata on the sites uh, to standard formats like EML in the case of data and inspire uh, environmental facilities for the actual sites, to expose and publish via standard services, OGC as a catchword, and to discover and visualize, for example, using B2Find in a concrete uh, collaboration <laughs> project in Enri, and to visualize. Uh, you will have assumed that there is some reasoning already behind this very simple graph. So a lot of work has been done over the past three months uh, to boil this down to real technical solution and test modules. Uh, if you want to know more about that tomorrow at 11.30, there is a session about DAMES and these technical solutions Three key messages. Most of the modules have been tested through these collaborations. That's nice. Uh, we have already visualization pilots. And the nice message is the tools don't matter. It's only that they need to be able to read the uh, standard formats and to provide the information in these standard formats. So the tools don't matter. Uh, and we can implement the system in a modular way. So final rush. How does this connect actually to GeoEco? Because that's part of the, uh, of the title. Uh, I think it's very simple. If you look at the sub-activities of the GeoEco uh, initiative, it's about standardized ecosystem classification, operational monitoring of key ecosystems and related ecosystem services. And they picked one specific kind of ecosystem, mountain environments, where we have a proportional share, of course, in the ILTR. Uh, and if you look into the motivations, I think they cover more or less most of the buzzwords I, I mentioned in my presentation. So planning, remote sensing, and in-situ data, biotic and abiotic components, geosphere, biosphere interactions, conversation, con conservation, EBVs, of course, ecosystem community of practice, very important aspect because it's all PI-driven to a big extent still, and that's a huge value in our business, and integrating several conceptual frameworks I just returned from a one-week workshop with extremely smart people in Israel, um, and we tried to develop this whole systems approach, the Wales approach, as an integrated framework for um, all these kinds of other conceptual frameworks uh, which we try to put together in one approach. Uh, summary, I think we can contribute uh, where we have most experience, defragmentation, streamlining, and integration. Uh, there is a registry which is globally tested. This means it has been accepted by people from various continents coming from very different working cultures and cultures. And it's multiply used, the outlook. Um, we are happy to implement priority features of DAMES still in the next 
one to two years in the context of existing projects. Uh, service expansion, hopefully in Eurogeos. Added value, I think all this undertaking is a real engine for cross RI integration. And last but not least, I think we have to use the opportunities from aligning the funding mechanisms and also the expertise from the actual environmental monitoring and standard monitoring schemes and reporting and the research sector. Learn more at the Envry Plus booth. And I think this is a credo which I have been using many, many times and it's still valid. Uh, if you want to go fast, go alone. And LTR is going slow, but I think we want to go very far together. Thanks. Oh, I have to steal the microphone. So are there questions to Michael? Yeah, thanks, Michael, for that excellent overview of this, this great initiative. How do you envisage to keep BAMES up to date, especially running, as, as far as I understand, as a distributed system with a growing huge number of participating sites? Well, I think this, this, this touches two aspects, how we want to maintain it technically and how we want to maintain it as a, u as a tool being used. Um, what we saw, and we just look at the uh, increasing number of, of accesses to DAMES, the more the system is used, the more people start using the URL of their site, which is described in, uh, uh, in DAMES, even as something like a business card, uh, the broader the use will be. Um, regarding the technical development, I think we have still the framework of Envy Plus in the Elta Horizon 2020 project, and we have to see where we get. There is a basic agreement uh, with the enterprise of Biosense from Serbia uh, to have this as a strategic product in the backs of their minds and wherever possible, carry it along in, in technical developments they're in charge of. <coughs> Just a comment, more than a question. I, I'm happy to see that there are many pieces of a puzzle that converge. One of these pieces is also the project EcoPotential, which I represent here, the European Horizon 2020 project, which uh, deals with 25 protected areas in Europe. And many of them are ELTER sites, and we work in strict contact with uh, ELTER. Um, tomorrow morning, you can have an overview also Eco Potential at the side event at 10.30. Thank you very much. I have one question, and this is um, along the lines of the integration part with remote sensing, because it's, I think, quite a challenge um, to really go from the in-situ data to something which can be really used for calibration and validation of, of remote sensing data. I think it's possible in some cases, and I think it's very good that you, you attempt to do that. But it's not always that straightforward because it needs to be represented, as we know, of that specific resolution, which is now, for example, the Sentinel potentially 20 or 10 meter, um, if it's the optical, but it could also be radar. So is there anything you have kind of thought or implemented to make sure that you can really do this scaling up also to any remote sensing uh, um, resolution? Because it seems really <laughs> important, but for me it seems not not that easy. It's just some, mm -hmm. some thought which, which came up, just mm -hmm. in case you have already thought about that. But also thanks for the very interesting presentation. Um, thank you. Uh, so yes, um, firstly, the, the site metadata have been bashed and squeezed and further developed for a decade. Um, so we have, besides from the size, the elevation, also the so-called observational or experimental design of the sites and the research topics. So we, wo we, we know roughly what's being done at the sites and can from there derive. Um, if they are suited, and an increasing number of data sets are also uploaded or even or at least documented. So we know, if, for example, if the fourth stand structure is available at the site and for which time span. Secondly, some sites, some national networks like Israel, for example, have a very, very strong collaboration with the Venus 
um, with the Venus project, so it's not Copernicus, I know, um, but they are developing um, smaller scale services, for example, for uh, soil humidity um, in, in bare ecosystems, so which don't have a forest cover. So there is a lot of development ongoing, and there are catchments like phenology, um, uh, leaf area index, uh, where I think we can collaborate quite well already now in, in, in further developing ground truthing services. Does this answer your, your question? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. I mean, the resolution, of course, is still a bit of an issue. Sometimes you're, you're not represented enough in situ data to make it upscalable to a grid level. So that can be an issue. But, yeah. I, maybe one more answer. I think we should keep in mind that, that the FTR main focus is to get a better mechanistic understanding of how representative or benchmark ecosystems function. It's not a probabilistic sampling based spatial monitoring effort. So we want to know how these benchmark research sites link to a given environmental zone, a given habitat, and how they work. So it's about this representativity, and the main output is actually to improve, to feed models, uh, which then, of course, the models, they are the key vector for the up and the down scaling. Can we put this to the, to the discussion? We have a, a little time in the end for, the, for general discussion, and before we come to this, I want to... Uh, uh, asked for the last presentation, and we want to uh, show here also a little bit the diversity of infrastructures. You have seen infrastructures like ICOS or LifeWatch related to directly related to grand challenges. A bit broader scientific approach was the the LTAR, but there's also an infrastructure called UFAR, and uh, UFAR is coordinating. Um, uh, um, airplane um, 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 observations and so it's more a, a technical infrastructure than a scientific or uh, uh, um, um, a grand challenge related uh, but with this um, uh, with this um, airplanes you can do a lot of observations and remote sensing and uh, uh, it's Royson is now showing how uh, Geobon and AquaWatch are uh, supported by by UFAR. Uh, Ilz has a Master of Science in Astronomy and a PhD in Nuclear Physics. Uh, and she began uh, her, her work at VITO with remote sensing in the year 2000, first as a researcher and then more and more going into program management and coordination. That's the fate of everybody of us. And uh, she coordinates the education and training activities in UFAR. So yeah. the floor is yours. Okay. Thank you very much, Lerna, for introducing me. Um, so I would like to give you a, a short introduction to uh, UFAR, the European Facility for Airborne Research, and then give you a few examples of ho how we contribute with this airborne data to uh, Geo uh, Bonn, in more particular, and uh, also Geo Aqua Watch. So, what is UFAR? It's an uh, integrating activity of the European Commission on the Framework Program 7. And UFAR stands for European Facility for Airborne Research and Environmental, uh, in Environmental and Geosciences. And it's a network, but it's also a project a research project, and it's dedicated to support airborne research, uh, so by improving the access to the uh, research infrastructure, the distributed facilities, most suited to the needs of the researchers uh, across Europe, provide also support and training, and also very important to um, enabling the sharing of expertise and harmonization of the research practices. Um, it started more or less in uh, 2000 with, an, uh, with nine partners, and then it um, became in 2004 an, a fully 
uh, integrated infrastructure initiative with uh, 22 partners. And then in um, 2008, we integrated in uh, UFAR a number of remote sensing partners and also um, hyperspectral imaging sensors and LiDAR sensors um, and thermal hyperspectral sensors. That's, um, so that's why um, that was in 2008. Um, and then um, um, we're now in the under the co the second UFAR contract. Uh, so and that contract will end the end of uh, the the end of January 2018. But um, we can also say that uh, in the uh, end of August we um, uh, have deposited our uh, statutes of a uh, sustainable legal structure called the U for AISBL to the notary, and we're now in the process of um, formalizing that uh, to have uh, 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 the constitution of the, a the U for AISBL um, by the end of this year or beginning of uh, next year. So to, uh, to have some sustainability um, in U for so to with uh, in kind contributions from the partners. Uh, we can provide a number of uh, activities to a limited extent than compared to a funded project. But with this U for ASBL, we're also preparing um, a proposal for the next uh, research infrastructure call. Mm, okay, um, so about U for two. Um, the, the network consists of about 15 aircraft and instrument operators, so they're indicated here in, uh, in orange. Um, most of the uh, operators, they operate uh, instrumented aircraft, but you also have a number of uh, operators who only, have, only provide an aircraft and other operators provide the instrument, like for example, for some hyperspectral remote sensing instrument, that's the case. Um, so there are nine networking activities, two joint research activities, um, 12 expo working groups, 19 instrumented aircraft, and five uh, remote sensing instruments. You can see all the, the countries that are involved. And these are the different activities that we uh, do in, in UFAR2. So the... the um, there's an activity on uh, strategy and European integration, so um, further cooperation with other research infrastructures, also cooperation with uh, ENVRI Plus, uh, and also building this sustainable legal structure, the U4AISBL, was one of the major milestones uh, of this activity. Then the coordination of transnational access, so transnational access means that any researchers in Europe can uh, submit a proposal which is then evaluated um, by an external group of scientists and when it's approved then um, the research we, we process we acquire the data and we process the data for these researchers um, open access these are other um, other modules other schemes to increase the an efficient use of um, of the uh, fleet Future of the fleet, so thinking about new platforms, uh, stratospheric platforms, but also drone platforms is part of this activity. Uh, technology transfer office is very important, was a new ex activity in uh, the current contract, so to transfer the knowledge from um, the, the, the researchers or the UFR community towards uh, industry. Education and training, that's what I'm coordinating, so that, that these are summer schools, training courses, combined with flights, uh, always. Standards and protocols, and this is where we collaborate a lot with ANVRI Plus, also on the reference model, and, and so it relates also to the database. Uh, so we have also an online uh, uh, database, and then e-communication is website and, and uh, newsletters. Uh, transnational access is a major part of the budget, so that's um, to provide the data to the to our researchers, the users of the infrastructure, and then two activities, research activities, to uh, improve the quality of the the data. Um, so one in remote sensing, with, that's also one activity that I'm coordinating, and one in uh, in atmosphere research. 
So this is an overview of all the uh, aircraft and instruments um, that we provide through transnational access to European scientists. A um, few words on the links to other research uh, infrastructure. So uh, UFR is also a member of the Envry Plus Beery Advisory Committee. Um, and as I said already, there we, we closely collaborate on the uh, Envry Plus reference model. Uh, which relates also to the database. And there are also um, collaborations with, with Actris and with uh, Iago's uh, research infrastructure, so in, in different activities, uh, you can see that. Then um, there was a bit of an introduction to you for now. I come to uh, what we have been organizing um, last few years and, and how this contributes to um, GEO. So this is the first uh, case. So we organized a training course uh, on airborne remote sensing for monitoring essential biodiversity variables in forest ecosystems. That was a training course um, coordinated or with the principal investigator, uh, Professor Andrew Skidmore from uh, Twente University, who is very active also in, uh, in GeoBon. Uh, so it was a two-week training course, one week at the Bavarian Forest National Park um, and one week at the DLR, German Aerospace Center. And uh, Bavarian Nas Forest National Park, is, they're suffering from bark beetle uh, um, infestations, uh, and they're using a lot of remote sensing data, also LiDAR data they're using very often, uh, but also hyperspectral data, and now we had the opportunity to collect also thermal hyperspectral data. Um, so we trained um, 90 stu PhD students and postdocs. We had 92 applications for this uh, training course. Um, the participants came from 15, um, um, working in 15, uh, uh, at 15 different nationalities and working in 10 EU member states. So we trained them in field measurements for um, essential biodiversity variables and also uh, in the processing of airborne hyperspectral data thermal data and LiDAR data for the retrieval of um, EBVs, which um, Leticia already explained uh, very well. Uh, so a few pictures. Um, then we had, um, of course, Professor Andrew Skidmore explaining about uh, what are remote sensing EBVs and, and um, the 10 remote sensing EBVs that they proposed uh, in, in this nature paper. Um, so as I said, the training course is always combined with an, uh, a flight uh, and with field measurements also, because these field measurements support the processing of the airborne data, which is, which this is very important. So they're we're trained in field measurements, but also trained in the acquisition plan and um, in the processing of the data. So there was a flight with the uh, NERC uh, Twin Otter, which was uh, equipped with a Phoenix um, uh, visible near infrared and shortwave infrared instru imaging instrument, and also with a thermal, hyperspectral <laughs> thermal uh, instrument. Uh, this, is a, this is the picture of the, uh, the NERC uh, aircraft that was used during, during this campaign. Um, that was one uh, contribution to Chiobon. Another one that I would like to mention is the DIARS. That's a, a project funded by uh, ERANET Biodiversa, um, and where we used airborne hyper imaging spectroscopy data for mapping uh, for impact assessment of uh, invasive alien uh, plant species. Oh. Um, so yeah, this is what these. Uh, uh, invasive species can do so. It's the second most important reason for biodiversity loss uh, worldwide, so after direct habitat loss. Um, and in this project, this DS project, they were focusing on a rather uh, difficult species um, and see what, what we can do with the hyperspectral images, but also combined with LiDAR data um, for mapping this, uh, this species, invasive species. 
So, and we used for that um, uh, APEX. It's the APEX is an airborne hyperspectral instrument that um, Vito and also University of Zurich developed for the European Space Agency as a simulator and also uh, for new uh, hyperspectral uh, for new satellite missions, for example. Um, so there was a flight in 2014. Sorry. Um, at the island of Silt in the north of uh, Germany. So we have, with this, with this IP APEX data, we have uh, pixel sizes of 1.8 meters. So it's a good intermediate level if you uh, want to go to satellite um, data. And this um, APEX sensor, they acquire data in 248 spectral bands. So a picture of uh, island of Silt here. And this is one of the uh, results from from that project. So they used an, um, or they developed a, a classifier. They used a, a classifier called Max Maximum Entropy, and they use all the 244 bands. <laughs> and um, so, and if, as you can see here, because we were discussing uh, field measurements also, these are all the validation plots and all the calibration plots that were used. And uh, the airborne data, um, from the airborne data, this is an, a map that can be derived from that. So an occurrence, probabili occur an occurrence probability of the uh, Campylopus introflexus with an accuracy of um, 0 0.75. So this, result, this is also published in, uh, in this paper. Um, now I come to water. So how? Can we contribute uh, with UFAR or airborne research um, to uh, Aqua Watch? So we um, we funded a campaign with the Apex again with the Apex imaging spectrometer, um, and that campaign was used to map water quality and aquatic vegetation uh, at Lake Mantua in Italy. Uh, and from that data, they could retrieve um, chlorophyll A, phycocyanin, uh, phytoplankton functional types, but also aquatic vegetation parameters like uh, macrophyte fractional cover, above water biomass, and community types. That was the work that was done by CNR um, uh, in Italy. And um, this is this is a result based on the airborne apex data. So they produced the chlorophyll map um, based on that, and then they translated that, that map into um, an, what they call a water framework directive um, uh, map. So uh, that gives an indication of uh, good or moderate or bad quality, uh, water quality. Um, another result from the same campaign, um, so a phycocyanin map, and then here an, um, a map of uh, uh, phytoplankton functional types. And in red, you can see here a uh, cyanobacteria species um, that was uh, dominated by um, uh, phycoerythrin pigments. Um, Last example is, um, so the same data was also used to, to study um, uh, wet, uh, wetlands uh, or veg wetland vegetation. So they mapped uh, fractional cover leaf area index above water biomass. And this is one of the results. So this is an, uh, a map of the macrophyte above water biomass for uh, Lake Mantua for a number of species. And here is the same for, um, this is a comparison of uh, macrophyte LIE uh, uh, from APEX data uh, in 2011 and 2014. Okay, my conclusion is that um, airborne hyperspe or UFAR, airborne hyperspectral images and research contribute I didn't show you a uh, result of that, but um, there is a paper by Hestir, uh, Aaron Hester, who is also here in the, the, the Geo Plenary, um, but that can be used for definition of future satel satellite mission requirements. Um, so they're currently running um, ESA studies for um, 
uh, Sentinel, future Sentinel missions, and these studies built really heavily on, on research that has been done with airborne data. Um, it can be used for validation of satellite-derived products. And what I showed in my presentation today is that it can be used for the retrieval of detailed uh, maps of invasive species, um, um, essential biodiversity variables, and inland and transitional water quality and aquatic vegetation parameters, but also for many other parameters I, I think about um, precision farming, for example. Um, important to mention also that all the UFAR data is in the database, can be downloaded, uh, it's freely available, so after registration, so I invite you all to have a look at the UFAR website and register, and then you get access to also protocols, best, best practices under the date, uh, that were developed under the data um, and standards uh, activity but also you can access um, all the UFAR funded data. Um, so, thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> and I think it's an uh, important uh, uh, stone between the in situ observations and the satellite observations to have all these airplanes flying. Are there questions? Is there a I don't know. Oh, okay. Sorry. Is there information on the uh, the Dyars project on the on the UFAR website? Yeah, uh, not on the UFAR website, uh, uh, but there is a Dyars website, and there you can see also publications. and And they're working on um, educational tools. So I think by the end of this year, they um, provide uh, a number of. <coughs> tools, data combined with some software tools um, to educate the next generation of, of uh, yeah, yeah, users of airborne data. Great, thank you. Are there more general questions or uh, contributions to the debate? Otherwise, I uh, want to, uh, to this presentation or to the general. Something because uh, uh, it's the context of the bag zebra from from the geo. Uh, there is a book in it, and and also a, show, uh, a small brochure, and I think it nicely shows also this uh, this effort of the infrastructures in many cases to take responsibility for educating and spreading the message. This is uh, I didn't know about it. A product of the US LTR network. Um, and uh, they work with school kids and they produce this painting book. So there is a, a, a wide range of activities and I think it's so important that and, and the infrastructures as I experienced them in Europe are really keen on taking this responsibility also as persons um, in where they live and um, where they are based locally. And I think this bag and the content is a very nice example from the United States. Thank you. Any other comments? What General comments? Uh, the one that is also related to ELTR, <laughs> coming back to the previous presentation. Stefan asked the question about the resolution of ground truth for the satellite. One of the key components developed within ELTR Horizon 2020 project is data integration, the integration portal, DIP, which foresees to integrate not only the data from DEMS, but make it possible for other data to be integrated into one place based on the open standard services and that way we, we will multiply the ground segment resolution for, for the ground, ground through data. Okay, we're coming to an end. Um, I hope we could give you uh, some impression how the, the research infrastructures can be working towards the towards the, the geo in general and towards the geo initiatives and flagship in, in, in uh, uh, special. So um, thank you for being here. Thank you very much to the to the presenters and contributors and uh, as I as I said earlier, uh, you're welcome to visit us in the Envy booth. 
um, you can easily find it with the with the graph that I've shown uh, at the walls. So welcome there, and thank you very much, and have a nice geo week.